Uh, hello. So, today we are going to talk about ethics in research and ethics in reporting research. And before we get into details of ethics in research reporting, we are also going to look a little bit at ethics of classroom teaching of student interactions and so on. Now, if you start thinking about ethics, uh, you know, it tends to be a very broad topic. But before I launch into the details of the topic, I would like to acknowledge that a lot of the material that I am going to talk about today has been taken from Professor Sahana Murthy's lecture on research methods in education technology. So, thanks to her. And now let us launch into the content of today's discussion. Okay. So, we were saying that ethics, if you just say well we are going to have a lecture on ethics, that lecture could extend for several hours. Because if we think about what ethics are, then it says well it is something that deals with the rightness or wrongness of certain actions and the goodness and badness of motives. Now, these are extremely broad definitions and I do not think we can be expected to do justice to this entire broad spectrum of definition. So, what we are going to do today is limit ourselves to ethics in academics. We will talk a little bit about what goes on in a classroom because quite a few of you would have interacted with students in several settings and what happens when we do research. These are the two topics that we will focus on. So, now in classroom what happens and I am sure you know you have seen this, this is a question that I like asking my students that you know the student and their friend, their roommate are taking the same course, there is a due date for an assignment and the friend has not done anything and wants to copy the assignment. What should the student do? Now, if you ask the students what they actually do and there is no punishment, usually the answer would be that you know they will give the assignment to the roommate, that is what they mostly do. But if you say no, 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 this is a question in an exam and there are two marks for right answer, there is minus one third for a wrong answer, then they know what the right answer is to get the two marks and that right answer is this, that you know you are not going to let the roommate copy the assignment, but because you are a good friend, you are going to sit and explain the problems to your roommate. So, they know what the right approach is, except that they do not do it, most of the times they do not do it. At most what they may do is this, they may show the assignment, they may you know tell the roommate not to copy, but they are not going to sit and check whether the roommate copies or they, they do not copy. So, you wonder sort of why this disconnect between knowing what to do, but doing something completely different. And the reasons that they most of the times give for something like this is well everyone does it, that is the most commonly given reason you know everybody does it. And when they say everybody does it, what they mean is that well copying has certain advantages, everybody is getting those advantages, so why should I be the only one who is being denied those advantages. Yeah. Of course, this goes hand in hand with the second point which says that even if you get caught, what happens? Nothing much happens. So, why should I forego the advantages when the risk of getting caught and punished is almost non-existent. And the other reason which they often give and you know I do sympathize with them there, I, mean, I do not agree with what they do is peer pressure. If they do not let the friend copy, then that student becomes the bad guy, you know and, and that is unpleasant, you know they are just trying to do the right thing, but they get branded as you know somebody who is too uptight, somebody who is not good friends, whatever. So, what can we as teachers do? to fix this problem? Well, some potential solutions are that maybe we can de-emphasize this trend of just getting the right answer, somehow or the other let us get the right answer. Maybe we can say that well, we are going to look at the effort that you have put in, we are going to devise methodologies for looking at the effort we you have put in, we are going to look at the creativity of your solutions and that is what is going to be evaluated. And the moment you say that, then that brings you to the second point that if you are going to try to evaluate how people think their way through a problem, then you have to design problems that bring out that thought process, right. How do they think their way through a problem? And that is a big challenge. 
know, designing those problems is non-trivial. But that can help a lot in preventing this, you know, sort of student copying. And of course, you know, if, if these things do not help, what would help is that if we had a very clear policy against copying and we implemented it. Uh, there also, you know, we are partly to blame because either we do not have a declared policy or we make case to case decisions, which is never good. So, if you are uniform, we said this is not okay and this is not okay under any circumstances, then maybe students will get the message. Okay. So, now, you know, students are one thing and research is another thing. When we talk of ethics in research, then we also know what we should and we should not do. Some things are very simple, you know, we should not do research that puts people at risk and we will look at one example of this. We should not do research that violates informed consent. We should not do research that is biased, you know, we should not sort of tailor our research in a way so as to benefit one group or one company or one industry. And we obviously should not copy research ideas from others, you know, that is just theft, intellectual theft and we should not indulge in this. For the first and the third points, we are going to look at a couple of examples now. So, what are those? Well, let us look at the first case study that you have been asked to characterize samples from a site where the ground may have been contaminated by some chemicals. Now, project is of national importance and the grant is very generous, but you do not have the safety tools. So, you need to put in place some measures so that people who work on these things are not affected by the contaminant, but that will take time and the funding agency says they want preliminary results within 6 months. What do you do? Well, you have a few options. You can take the project, you can tell the person who is doing the experiments that well, you know, just be a little careful with these samples, but you do not disclose all the potential risks. Some of them could be potentially life threatening. Or do you explain to the funding agency the importance of putting proper safety measures in place and refuse to start the project before that? Now, again, we know that the second option is the right option, that is what we should do. But we often end up taking the first option and the reasons we give are sort of similar to the reasons that our students give. You know, if I do not do it, somebody else will do it. It is not like it is not going to get done. You know, because I know the hazards, I can, you know, maybe try to protect people better and all of those things. But we all know that strictly speaking, the second option is the one that we should take. Let us look at another example. You know, you have a discussion with a company which is interested in having you as a consultant to evaluate a new product. And what they let you know very subtly during the discussion without putting anything on paper that if they get your strong support, you know, because you are this big famous researcher in this area, then if they get your endorsement of the product that they are developing, they will become market leaders in this area. And if that happens, that can help lead to a long research partnership with your group and they are like, well, you know, that partnership will be beneficial for both and we both know that together we can accomplish great wonderful things. Do you see any problems with accepting this consulting assignment? No? And again, well, when you make this decision, you know, is there a problem, is there not a problem? The things that you evaluate is that, well, it is a lucrative proposition, it is a very interesting problem and if I do not take this, what sort of an effect is it going to have on my career, the papers I publish, the kind of promotions do I take, you know, what is all of that going to come to. And again, if I do not do it, someone else will. So, what I will do is, I will take the project and I will give an accurate report. When I think we all know that if you take a project under these kind of pressures, it may not be very easy for you to be able to give a report which is very clearly contrary to what the industry expects. You know, you may not be able to say that, well, you know, there is already a better product in the market and it is not being made by this company, if that is your deduction. So, again, you know, you have to be aware of the constraints that are being put on you. You have to be aware of the repercussions of the deal that you are making 
And ideally speaking, that is what the statement is read is that success or excellence in research should not be based on these kind of compromises. Now, you should not have to say, well, let us take it, let us see how it goes, let us start the work, let us tell the project staff to put on gloves, you know, maybe the radiation is not that much. So, those are things that we come across sometimes during our research and it is important that we also make the right decision, so that we can convey the same to our students. Okay. So, thanks for listening to this part of the lecture on ethics and we will end now.